Today, we hear from Sarah Ann Massey, who, like many others, was assaulted by Harvey Weinstein. The full circle moment is that Sarah Ann had a role in the film, she said, about the investigation on Harvey Weinstein's sexual harassment, assault, and abuse of numerous women. What happens when speaking out means giving up dreams, aspirations, and a lifetime of work? Sarah Ann takes us through what her experience of trauma survivorship looks like. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. Sarah Ann Massey, welcome to Navigating Narcissism. It is such a pleasure and honor to have you on. You're doing some really amazing and important things in the industry. And before we get to all of that, I would like to start with your backstory, which um, in this year when the films She Said just came out, um, you were you were assaulted by mm-hmm. Harvey Weinstein. And From there, some really extraordinary things happened in your story and in your career. So I'd like to start at the beginning, Sarah Ann, and I'd Mm -hmm. like to ask you, how did you become acquainted with Harvey Weinstein? I had just moved to New York. I was a young theater actor, and I had started my own theater company and, you know, was sort of trying to do that thing I'd been dreaming of since Mm -hmm. I was a little girl. And I was a nanny as my day job. I you know all my friends were waiters and bartenders, but I loved kids. And after living in New York for a little while, I realized my one part-time nannying job was not enough to cover all of my bills. So I looked for a second job and I found a nannying agency and they sort of catered to like, you know, higher net worth clientele. Mm-hmm. And I thought it would be good. I could get a, a part-time job and make some more money and continue to support my acting. So they contacted me and said, we have a client who we think would be really good for you. They work in the entertainment industry and we know that you've worked with clients who work in the entertainment industry before. And would you be interested in meeting with them? And I said, yeah, sure. And they said, okay, it's a a producer named Harvey Weinstein. And I said, oh yeah, of course I know who that is, you know, biggest producer in the country. And I didn't really think twice about it. I'm not someone who gets starstruck or, you know, Mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And I'm used to being around folks who work in the industry. And I thought it would be good because I understood the world that he was coming from. And I've always made it very clear that, like, I draw a very fine line between, or not a fine line, a very bright line between my acting work and my nannying work. So there was never any concern about, you know, having it be like a conflict of interest or anything. Mm -hmm. So... They thought I should go out on the interview. And prior to meeting with Harvey, I actually had a few interviews with two of his female assistants in New York. And they took me out to breakfast and they sort of explained how the job would work. And at the time, I didn't think anything of it, but they kept mentioning how discretion was very important. And I thought, well, sure, he'll have famous people around and they don't want me selling photographs off my phone to the paparazzi. I get it. Totally makes sense. I understand. And they explained to me that I would have to go to Connecticut for the interview, go to his home in Connecticut, and that, um, you know, I would be meeting with him and his children at his home, which is what I'm used to with Mm -hmm. knitting. Uh, You know, you always, you almost always go to the person's home and you meet with them and the family. And so I felt comfortable. I felt confident. They had mentioned a few times that they wanted to make sure that me being an actor wasn't going to be a problem. And I said to them what I said to you, I would never utilize my position as a nanny to try to advance my career. I keep a very you know clear delineation between those two worlds. And they mm-hmm. seemed really comfortable with that. So I... I grew up in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So I went to my parents' house in Connecticut and 
I was preparing for the interview and the night before I got contacted by one of the assistants and said, I'm not going to be able to be there. Sorry, but let me know how it goes. So I was expecting this assistant to be there. And again, I, I thought, okay, it'll be fine. I'm, I'm not worried about it. I've been on a million of these interviews before. And then I walked into essentially what had been a trap that was set for me at his home. Hmm. And he, um, yeah, he just was the fur furthest thing from professional. He opened the door in his underwear. Um, and at this point I'm parked in this, you know, driveway that's a mile from the street behind a huge locked gate. And I thought he probably forgot about the interview and it was a weekend and he was relaxing in his house and would be embarrassed and would excuse mm. himself to change before we did the interview. You know, I'm, I'm young and I'm naive and I am trusting and not assuming anything nefarious is happening, but he did not. He conducted the entire interview in his underwear. He asked me about my acting, which I was one of the first things I felt uncomfortable about. He wanted to see my resume and headshot. And because I always carried the same bag with me to auditions or to interviews, I had them. And so I, I gave them to him and he, um, you know, was asking me a lot about that. And I kept trying to redirect. And at one point I thought we were completely alone and I, I started feeling more and more uncomfortable, but again, I had no real way to get out. And at one point, two of his children ran in and I felt relief. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, okay, we're going to get back on track. It's going to be fine. And the second they came into the room, he turned like night and day. He went from, I think he was attempting to be charming to being this roaring monster, screaming at his children to leave the room, to leave us alone, to not come back in until I had left, that we must be left alone. And that's when I knew I was in like definitive danger. Um, when they left, he shifted right back. Right here, this flipped anger switch, going from an attempt to be charming or flirtatious to rageful. Sarah Ann amazingly picked up on it and recognized she was in danger. But it is remarkable how often this flip is missed or justified. Well-regulated people keep things even keeled. But if a person is attempting to dominate a situation and are interrupted in that, well, that's precisely the kind of situation that will flip the switch of an antagonistic person. And he started sexually harassing me. He started asking me if I would ever use sex to get ahead in my acting career. He started asking me if I would ever flirt with or sleep with his friends to get ahead in my acting career. Both times I answered definitively no. I was clearly you know, offended by the question. And he kept asking me questions. And I was sort of at this point really having this trauma response of, you know, freezing and panicking and just trying to stay calm. And he stood up and I thought, okay, either he's going to let me go or he's going to attack me. Hopefully this is the end of the interview and I, I get out. And he approached me and I thought he was going to shake my hand and he grabbed me and he pulled me in. And he pressed his genitals against me and he held me really tight and really long. And I was just completely frozen. And I don't know how long it lasted. It felt like it lasted hours. It was probably seconds or minutes. And he whispered that he loved me. And then he let me go. And he let me out the door. And I, I mean, I, I really don't know how to explain the level of fear that I was experiencing. Cause like I said, I'm young, I'm alone. I'm locked behind this gate on this compound. Nobody could hear me. Nobody could help me. And I think the thing that really sticks out to me is I remember driving there very clearly. Cause I, like I said, I grew up there. I knew the roads. I knew exactly where I was going once I saw the address. And when I left, the last thing I remember is looking down at my feet on the driveway. I don't remember driving home. I don't remember how I got back to my parents' house. I clearly was just completely shutting down. And the next thing I remember is like being mid-sentence talking to my mom. She had clearly asked me how things went and saw that I looked upset. And yeah, it was like, I mean, even now it's such a long time later, just retelling this story. I'm so activated and I have to try to remind my brain that I'm not in that place anymore. I'm safe now, but it, it was really terrifying. And, you know, it's not the first time I had been abused by a man and it wasn't the last time. Mm. And I think some people 
when they hear about trauma or abuse, they sort of rank it in their minds and they go, well, it wasn't rape. So you lucked out. And I, I even had that idea in my head, like, oh, it could have been worse. But two months prior to this, I was raped. And I have to say the level of trauma is very similar. And the long-term impacts with what Harvey did to me are very extreme. It had a really intense impact on my career, on my health. I developed chronic illnesses on my mental health. Um, I lost a, a lot of time in my career and faced economic harm. And I think, so people need to sort of be more aware of the mm -hmm. fact that the power dynamics at play can have a really big impact and having no expectation of that going in, there was no preparation that I might be in danger that somebody might try to sexualize me and sexually mm -hmm. assault me. So I think that really means that for me, I was so unprepared that it came as such a shock and such a, a terrifying experience that it really impacted me for a very long time. Your nervous right. system was already living into the next thing that could conceivably happen. And what we what we forget mm -hmm. is that the brain is always saying, okay, this terrible thing is about to happen. And the reaction, the cascade that happens in our body is as though it does happen. So when in that mm -hmm. moment, you didn't know how bad it was going to get. So the terror you experienced was the terror of, of, of trauma, you know, that which is, is mm -hmm. so linked into uncertainty. What's going to happen next? Am I going to die? Which is often the question people ask themselves. You also then bring up the next piece of trauma we don't talk about enough, which is we often think of trauma as an episode. A thing that happens, mm -hmm. an episode that happens. And as you describe it, the impact of this episode lasted for years and years and years. And when people say, well, that was a day, it was an afternoon, it was an hour, mm -hmm. really? Could it be affecting you 10, 15 years later? To which it is a resounding yes. And not only did it affect you structurally, we're going to get to into how this affected your career because of how the entertainment mm -hmm. industry is set. It affected you physically. It affected your mental health. Mm -hmm. That episode that other people are going to say it was just an hour, time doesn't follow the usual rules when it comes to mental health. And that hour mm -hmm. became something that would echo through your life. So I really appreciate you talking about not just the moment, but how, how far that reaches. And in any relationship, when somebody has mm -hmm. that kind of betrayal, and that was a betrayal. You went in there with trust. It's it's quite it's very very impactful. I want to ask you in the in the aftermath of that. It sounds like you went home and talked to your mm -hmm. mother. Did you share with your mother what happened? I did, and she's one of the only people I actually told. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting watching her as I spoke because, you know, I think she could tell something was off, but I think she also knew that he had a reputation of being kind of like a, a tough boss. So I think maybe she was thinking more along those lines. And as I told her what happened beat by beat, I saw her face fall and I saw it hit her. And it was validating actually to see that because I, you know, the, the brain does a lot of funny things in the aftermath of trauma. And then I've learned a lot about the neurobiology of trauma over the years. And you try to make sense of what happened to you and you try to make it okay and yeah. make yourself feel safe again. And so seeing her react and, and hearing her react as though this was not okay, not normal, that he had done something wrong, validated for me all of those mm. feelings that I had. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, not all of us get that when we disclose for the first mm -hmm. time. We don't always get support and belief. And so I feel very grateful that I had that. But having said that, you know, she didn't say anything about, and I didn't think about going to the police or mm -hmm. even reporting it to the nannying agency. I, I didn't even know how to begin how to talk about it. And I was instantly afraid of the impact it would have on my life mm -hmm. if I told people. Mm -hmm my life, my career, all of it. That was such a huge fear for me for such a long time that I did just keep it quiet. And a few people who were very close to me knew, and that was it. When this happened to you, and you know, again, I want to go back to your, what you said is that many people go through something like this and they have nowhere to take it, right? When mm -hmm. we, I really, actually, it, it, I shudder to think how much unreported trauma, mm. unshared stories of abuse, not just in the entertainment industry, in all industries, mm. workplaces, in life in general, how much has been unsaid and how much people carry this pain 
within them throughout their lives. Having that place, like you said, was important. It's not enough. And then on top of that, you had to make these calculations in your head, these decisions of if I talk about this more, then these other things can happen. You're a young person. And that's all mm-hmm. very real. There, that's not that's there's actually nothing sort of ang- people say, oh, maybe you're just being anxious. You're not being anxious. You're being realistic. Yes. When this happened to you, Sarah Ann, at this time, though, none of this story had broken. So all we knew was, I guess some people knew that Harvey Weinstein was just an angry dude and mm-hmm. had a lot of bluster as a boss. That seemed to be the talk you know, around the industry. But mm-hmm. none of the rest of this had come out. So you didn't have a, you didn't have a context to place this in. And, and am I right about that? That's completely right. I do think there are some people who were, you know, within his sphere who knew what he was doing. Of course, of course. And there's been this narrative, oh, everybody knew. But I can tell you as a young actor who had just moved to New York, I didn't know. And I didn't know a lot of other actresses who were, you know, I was just starting to dip my toe into film and TV. Like that was my dream was to move into that next chapter. I didn't have other people to talk about this with. I didn't feel safe to. So I had no idea. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the New York Times story broke that I knew I wasn't alone. That was almost 10 years later. Yeah. So how did you feel in that moment? So this this thing you've been carrying within you, this trauma, this this and the pain it caused you. Mm. You you shared it with your mother, but with no one else. And you're making your way in this industry. How did you feel? When you read that, I was I remember the day that story came out, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I did not have the direct impact of it. And I, I almost dropped the paper at the time. How did you feel when you read that story? It was really surreal. I was in Europe at the time. My husband mm-hmm. is British and we were over there visiting family and we were about to film a short film that I had written and was acting in. And I saw the story and I felt equal parts just destroyed that this had happened to so many people, but also relieved that I wasn't alone. And a sense of, okay, if we're finally talking about this, maybe finally he'll be held accountable for what happened. Maybe I won't have to be afraid anymore. Maybe I can move through this industry in a way that feels safer because I had put my career off. I had a really big head start. I didn't go to college. I trained at a professional acting school in New York. I was the youngest person they had ever accepted, started my own theater company, had started like trying to take meetings with agents. And when Harvey did what he did to me, I pulled way back. Mm. I didn't feel safe going into audition rooms and meeting rooms with strange men who I didn't know. I was afraid he might be in a room that I entered into. So I kept creating. I kept making theater with people I trusted, but I really lost a lot of time. And it was only when I met my husband, we started working together. We started writing comedy together and creating together. And I suddenly felt safe again because he would go with me to auditions. He would go with me to meetings. I knew I had somebody there if something went wrong. And so I just started getting my career back and I I felt hopeful that this would be a shift, this would be a change. And as the days progressed and more and more stories came out, again, completely sickened that this had been going on for 30 years and there were so many people, but also hopeful. We're finally Mm. talking about this. We're finally taking this out of the shadows. Maybe things can finally change. Did that... Did the did that did the New York Times story coming out lead you to feel like you could speak out? Yeah, exactly that. And it was funny. I thought at first I would just write on my Facebook, like sort of the broad strokes of what had happened to me. I thought, okay, all my Facebook friends will hear what happened and mm-hmm. they'll know and it'll be off my chest. And that's that. I'm not famous. I'm not going to talk to the press like, you know. But a friend of mine saw what I wrote and asked me if I would be willing to talk to the press. And I wasn't sure, but I said I'd talk to someone off the record. And I did, and I felt comfortable. I felt like my story would be safe in her hands, and I allowed Variety to publish. Mm. Again, uh, the the big beats of what had happened to me, as you know, Mm -hmm. it takes time to fully process when you start retelling your narrative and Mm -hmm. finding all of the strength to talk, to talk about the details. So I shared sort of the broad beats of my story and I thought that would be it. Um, 
but I kept getting press requests and, um, I was, I was lucky to be filming this movie at the time because I could sort of escape onto my set and my whole crew knew what was happening and they were really protective of me and made me feel safe. And so it felt a little bit like, um, like a nice bookend to be talking about this thing that had held me back for so long while creating and making art and doing something I really believed in. So I felt encouraged at first. I didn't feel afraid that there would be the retaliation that I was so afraid of for a decade mm -hmm. because we were all telling our stories together and it looked mm -hmm. like he was going to lose his mm -hmm. job. And so I thought, surely what could possibly happen now? What could go wrong now? Nobody could hold it against us. There's so many of, I mean, it's, I think now 111 people have officially gone on the record about Harvey abusing them. So what did happen after you spoke out in Variety? Well, for about a month and a half, I had nothing but support, you know, friends, family, strangers, all would write to me and, you know, thank me for coming forward. And I, that was one reason I wanted to share my story is, yes, I was an actress, but it also happened in the context of domestic work. Yeah. Yes. And I think that some domestic workers are so, so often abused and those stories don't get told very frequently. So I wanted to share that to hopefully give other people a sense that they weren't alone in what they were going through. So I felt, I felt good about it. I felt okay. And I felt empowered to keep speaking. I had always been very passionate about these issues, you know, ending sexual violence and uh, gender-based violence. And now to be able to contextualize why it mattered so much to me personally felt good. Mm -hmm. And like, I could do some good. And I met a lot of other survivors and we started talking about trying to do work together, advocacy work together. But then about a month and a half after I got a call from my agent at the time and she told me that she was getting angry phone calls from casting directors, um, that I needed to stop already. I'd already told my story enough was enough that I was going to be blacklisted. And it was like all of my fears coming true. And I chose to believe that this was her operating from her own place of fear and that surely this couldn't possibly really happen. Maybe, okay, maybe she got a phone call or two, but it would be okay. And I watched, I had just moved to LA at this point. Um, and I was getting probably about a half a dozen auditions a month, which is good for moving to a new market and having a small agent. And I watched that dry up very quickly. Hmm. And it's now five years later. And I think I've probably had around a half a dozen auditions in the subsequent five years. It's been very extreme and very dramatic and very uh, trackable what's happened to me. And it hasn't just happened to me. It's happened to a lot of people. My question here is it's it's we had heard in, in the watching She Said, reading the, the myriad, mm -hmm. you know, articles and uh, written about this. And what we had heard how people who had turned away Harvey Weinstein's advances would often or or speak out against him or not given mm -hmm. he would face his wrath and w that would be incurred in not getting parts yeah. and that didn't even people who are actually decently you know like relatively big names were having that experience yes. across the whole continuum of people who were still coming up in the industry people who had come up in the industry in mm -hmm. your case the article was already out the new york times mm -hmm. article was already out and your agent was still afraid. So so Weinstein still held a lot of power in the industry, is what you're telling me, even after the Times piece came out. Yeah, I think it's pretty layered what's going on here. Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, when, when this happened to me, I talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, well, if people are angry at me already, I'm not going to hide this. I'm not going to once again be afraid. And because I started talking about what was happening to me, other people started sharing mm -hmm. with me that they were having, like you said, very successful people, mm -hmm. people who were sort of just coming up, people losing their agents, getting dropped from pilots, having all their auditions dry up. And it was just the same story over and over again. And so I think it comes down to, yes, I think Harvey still has power in this industry. I think he still has friends. Mm -hmm. But I also think there are still abusers in this industry mm -hmm. who are afraid to be found out. And I think there are people who, even if they have nothing to hide themselves, they're afraid of the squeaky wheel. They don't want to rock the boat. And I think these tend to be, you know, maybe lower level gatekeepers, not necessarily the people who are running the studios. I think they don't really have that fear. And so when I've talked to some of them, 
they've gone, oh, this is terrible that this is happening. We have to do something about it. This shouldn't be happening. But it's it's such a big industry and it's difficult to break into mm-hmm. in the best of times. But it's, I think it's implicit and explicit retaliation. I think there's a lot going on that uh, pro- provokes these barriers of entry to folks who have been marginalized in all sorts of ways, but certainly survivors of sexual violence and it, it's got to shift and it's got to change. And so I'm trying to do something about that. What is it that's unique about the entertainment industry that you believe enables this level, this reach of abuse of vulnerable folks? I I always talk about the fact that this is not exclusive to the entertainment industry, no. as you've mentioned yourself, mm-hmm. but there are things that make this unique. And I, I'm a member of SAG-AFTRA and I work on a lot of committees, uh, including the National Sexual Harassment Prevention Committee. And I talk a lot about the fact that, you know, most people in their jobs are not lucky to get an interview and then having to interview a hundred times before they get a job. Mm -hmm. Um, Most people are not having to go into private spaces with very limited people and having to be extremely emotionally vulnerable. Most people are not asked to be almost naked and do sex scenes or intimate scenes on set. Most people are not asked to constantly relive traumatic experiences. There's a lot That means that folks who work in this industry are vulnerable. We work very long hours. We have to fight very hard for protections from our unions, and not everybody is in the union. And there's a very clear, I mean, maybe it's not very clear, maybe it's very murky, but there is a very distinct power dynamic that Mm. exists. There are Mm -hmm. all of these layers of gatekeeping that you have to get through to get to the next thing. And I know exceptionally famous, successful actors who are still afraid to speak up on set if something makes them uncomfortable because when they do, they get pushback. And I think that we need to keep putting in these sort of safety nets. I think of it like having prop guns on set or having stunts on set. These are safety issues. Mm -hmm. This is, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) bodily autonomy and bodily safety. And I think if we can start thinking about it in that way, we would have a a better response from the folks who are currently in power mm-hmm. to put these things in place because it protects them too. It limits their liability. It creates a safer and happier work environment. It allows people to be more creative. Um, and there are things like intimacy coordinators and well-being coordinators that exist that help with that, but we just have to sort of normalize that part mm-hmm. of it. So many people are trying to get into it, right? So there's mm-hmm. this really interesting research out there on something called institutional betrayal. Okay, Mm. so when it's entire, it's it's not it's not taking a lot of what we might even see in individual betrayal, but it's happening at an institutional level. And much like you'd even see in a family where abuse is happening and there is a real pressure to close ranks. Let's not talk Mm -hmm. about this outside of here. Gaslighting. Did that ever really happen? And one thing we do know about institutional betrayal is that industries where there is a really high bar to entry, where there is a lot of prestige, where there is um, the possibility of really high status or gains to come. And there's a lot of these gatekeeping sorts of like hoops to jump through, if, as it were. Mm-hmm. Those are the industries where institutional betrayal is most likely to happen. And the entertainment industry is really that because there's thousands of people clamoring for, you know, very, mm-hmm. very far fewer jobs with the hope of the big, big return someday. And these patterns seem to be pretty ancient. I mean, I think that tropes of things like the casting couch, those aren't those mm-hmm. aren't fictions. These are, we, we no. hear as we as more and more people do historical work on what the early years of the motion picture industry were, it was nothing but abuse, often of underage Mm -hmm. performers. Um, And absolutely nothing was done about it. If anything, Mm -hmm. the, the abusers were absolutely emboldened. So this really definitely feels like it's intergenerational within this industry. Mm -hmm. It's been in place for a long time. The stakes are really high. And then you brought up something really interesting, which is even very seasoned performers, people who are marquee names, have an anxiety about speaking out because 
because the fact is they were indoctrinated into this. You know, that it's mm-hmm. again, it's like a family where you learned we don't we don't talk about that. Let's not bring it up. I don't want to stir the pot. And their own handlers, agents, managers, representatives saying, don't you know, let's not say anything. Come on. Is, is that really affecting you? Is that really a problem? And that is you're right. It's all it's numerous workplace settings. It does seem to be quite pronounced in entertainment. And I think also there's big age gaps. You have young, young people Mm -hmm. entering an industry who often just lack institutional power from that. People who are in senior positions who are decision making. But I also really love what you said, Sarah Ann, about domestic workers, household workers, people Mm. who really, really have very little social power and the amount of abuses that happen there. So I'm so glad you put a lens on that because when we look at the harassment literature, what we see in people who are in industries like retail, bartending, uh, other service um, employees, they actually Mm -hmm. report the highest rates of harassment harassment in the workplace. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. And, you know, something you mentioned about the really big stars who are afraid to speak up, I don't think it's only the indoctrination. I think it's the real risk of economic harm. Hmm. Even the people I know who are the most successful people in this industry, they're always wondering when the next job will come, if the next job Hmm. will come. It's weirdly expensive to work in this industry. Once you do have a modicum of success, hiring publicists and paying your agent and your manager their fee and whatever your housing costs are, yes, your wealth is going up, but it's you don't know how temporary it is. So there's this real economic harm that can come yeah. from speaking. I mean, I've certainly faced it. My finances have been massively impacted by the fact that I have basically barely been able to work the past five years in the industry that I am trained to work in. And regardless of what level or what scale you're working at, that fear of loss of income and loss of ability to work is very motivating and very real. And Mm. that's kind of the part I'm trying Mm. to address is not just creating the safety, but also taking away the barriers to entry and taking away the Mm. fear of speaking. Mm -hmm. You talk about the thousands of people. There was a film that I was involved with recently, an independent film. And um, I will talk about this more later, but I run this organization called Hire Survivors Hollywood. And they teamed with us on it. And so they wanted to make sure that they were hiring survivors in the roles that were available. And they put out a casting notice with their partnership with us. And they said that if you would like to self-identify as a survivor of sexual violence, you could mark it in your notes. And the guarantee was that they would look at your materials. It wasn't a guarantee that you would get hired, Mm. but they had 18 roles. They got about 18,000 submissions and they cast four survivors. So about a quarter of the roles ended up going to survivors because they took that step. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a guarantee of employment. It's just a guarantee that there aren't going to be extra barriers put in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's such a such an important point because I don't think everyone appreciates what it means to work on this on this basis where you are always having to think about the next gig. A lot of shows have limited runs. Every show is mm-hmm. going to end at some point. Every film is mm-hmm. a finite period of work. And that yeah. idea of working, working so hard and then having to think about what's the next gig going to be, it really does take away your power. It can even make it hard to find an apartment when you can't show steady oh, yeah. income or any of that. So all the things that a person needs to feel stable are taken away. And then it puts people in incredibly compromised positions mm-hmm. um, where they're and, and in an industry where they already don't have power. So this is bigger than than just the what we heard in this one story of Harvey Weinstein. Mm-hmm. This is a far, far bigger t- sort of indictment of how the entertainment industry runs itself and the magnified vulnerability it puts people in by how it runs. So I think it's really mm-hmm. amazing that you're creating that awareness. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how do you think, because this is only happening because the abusers are protected. How is it that these big media companies, production companies, whatever, how are they protecting these abusers? I think historically it's been a financial decision. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone like Harvey Weinstein was making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so there was an impetus to protect him because he was the moneymaker. And the way in which I've talked about this a lot is that our industry has a responsibility because we create culture and we create Mm -hmm. media and we create entertainment. And that's what shapes 
um, cultural ideas and cultural norms. And so there's this very dark side to it that we're talking about now, but there's also a really hopeful side where if we shift, if we do the things that we need to do in order to tell stories that are more honest about what it is to be a human being, to have better representation on screen and behind the camera, to, you know, create safer work environments, not only can we create great art that brings in lots of money, but we can shift the cultural conversation to create a more empathetic, kinder, safer, more equitable world. And when I talk to the folks who are in positions of power, I say to them, look, I believe you should do this because it's the right thing to do. But also it's a very smart PR move. This is very positive publicity for you. It's a very smart financial move. There's a lot of underserved markets who have a lot of spending power and who you will draw in to your projects if they are ethically aligned and mm -hmm. if they're culturally aligned with what these groups of people want to see and are so hungry to see. And on top of that, it lessens liability on your sets. It allows your director to know that they can focus on their job and they have an intimacy coordinator to handle mm -hmm the awkward and complicated and difficult staging of those intimate and hyper-exposed scenes. It allows everybody to do their jobs and feel like they're safe. And we at Higher Survivors Hollywood advocate for having things like pre-employment, trauma-informed training. That's great. Um, we advocate for things like safety meetings in any project where there is going to be a hyper-exposed or intimate scene, just like if there was going to be a stunt performed. We advocate for having access to mental health professionals, to having a trauma-informed therapist on set on the days where you're filming something that might be sensitive, even if it's not sexual or gender-based violence, if it's something that it has to do with racial violence or you know all mm -hmm. these different things. And we have this, I think, 22-page toolkit that I've authored, and it's free, and it's available for everybody who works in this industry to get some guidance, and we do consulting. And there's a lot of help out there to shift the narrative and to shift the culture. And more people than you would expect, I think, are open to it. It's just about letting people yeah. know that these resources exist. I worked on a project, we consulted on a project that had a $3,000 budget, and they were still able to hire an intimacy coordinator and hire several survivors to be in the project. And she said, which I was involved in, they did a lot of things right. They had access to a therapist for all of us on, uh, you know, via phone at any time. They consulted with people who were depicted in the film when developing the script. They did hire survivors to be in the film. And... Um, I don't know how much of that they were planning to do already, but I called Universal when the film was announced. I called their switchboard <laughs> and I got in touch with an executive there and I didn't pitch myself as an actor. I just wanted to let them know about higher survivors because I thought it was such a, an obvious opportunity with this film. And they took a meeting with me. I, I met with their equity and inclusion department and I told them about what we were trying to do and how I thought it could work. And I sort of thought I'd never hear from them again. And hopefully it just would plant a seed. And then I got an audition and I found out that several Weinstein survivors got auditions and a few of us got hired. And so, you know, that was a $32 million budget film and there was this $3,000, you know, new media project. Anybody can yeah. integrate these steps. Anybody can help make a difference. And we've gotten so many survivors work and auditions and interviews. Mm -hmm. And it's just like me and one other person running this right now. We've just brought in an advisory board of 30 people who are incredible, but I keep thinking like if I'm just one little person and I can mm -hmm. make these things happen, imagine if everybody mm -hmm. gets on board. Imagine if we join together to really push things forward and get out of that deeply problematic and toxic and abusive culture that sort of knit together this industry in the first place and, and remake it into what we mm -hmm. want it to be. In a way, what healing is about is about persistence, right? Mm -hmm. It's about getting up in the morning. It's about doing things no matter what the size of the project is. It's about picking the phone up uh, and you're getting through in the switchboard and actually getting through. It's those. Mm -hmm. It's giving ourselves permission to take small steps to take back our power and our narratives and by extension benefit systems around us and then when mm -hmm. we really feel empowered to actually – try to address those systems. So I think that what you're doing in a much larger way is what people who are healing are doing in a smaller individual way, if you will, mm. every single day. And I, and I think that those are two really parallel processes. And I really do appreciate that there is that sense of there, there is some hope in this. Like we don't, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be 
again, an indictment of an industry, but you also bring up something very important. The entertainment industry sits in a very unique space where they create culture. So they mm -hmm. can create new stories, right? They're, they're, whether that is through representation, how stories are told, and protecting the people who tell the stories, that there's something mm -hmm. quite powerful then that actually sort of seeps into the groundwater of a culture. You also, though, bring up this issue, and I'll go back to the dark side for a minute, which is where, mm. unfortunately, as a narcissism person, I often dwell in the dark side. <laughs> yeah. But on that dark side, you brought up this concept of really what I call the golden goose, that mm -hmm. institutions, systems, companies protect the golden goose. And as if somebody's making money or get, getting looks or likes or clicks or whatever it is that we, mm -hmm. they want, the the enabling and subsequent emboldening of those individuals and protecting of those individuals within industries has been traditionally problematic. I do agree with you that the financial risks that are now being raised by mm -hmm. having people who are abusive on a team, on a staff running a company, I think for the first time ever, we're starting to see, I don't know if it's a shift in moral conscience, but I do mm. know it's a shift on saying we can't afford. This isn't even just about dollars and cents on their budgets. It's about all the other people, the sponsorship, all of that that gets mm -hmm. pulled away. There is an accountability. And that to me is a meaningful shift. It's not enough yet, but it's steps right. in the right direction. I agree. And I think I'm I'm very tired of people asking me what I think about, quote unquote, cancel culture. I think what it is is accountability. It's not can cancel culture. Mm -hmm. It's it's holding people accountable for the harm that they've caused. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means they've caused companies financial harm, and so they mm -hmm. drop them. And sometimes it means they've caused actual, you know, criminal harm, and then they have to be held accountable mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. But accountability is essential. I think we could have really long, complicated conversations about the state of the criminal justice system in this country and globally and whether or not it should even exist in the state it does now. But even if we were able to shift, and I hope we get to the point where we're able to shift away from the carceral system and all of these things, accountability will always be a part of it. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to be held accountable for your actions, both good and bad, all of us. None of us are perfect. We all make missteps. But there's a difference between making a mistake, making an error, harming someone unintentionally, learning from it, growing, changing, and being somebody who is just ritually and serially mm -hmm. abusing and causing harm. And maybe somebody like Harvey stops doing that if early on he's actually held accountable. We don't know. I don't know. I can't pretend to know the inner workings of his mind. And maybe not. Maybe he was always going to be somebody who would just exercise his power in this way. But I think we have to stop being afraid of accountability and embrace mm -hmm. it as the transformative tool that it is. The name of this podcast is Navigating Narcissism, yes. and it's a very big umbrella term. You talk about this. It's, I've never heard someone use it, these words this way, and it's, it's actually quite beautiful, ritually and serially abusive. You know, that mm -hmm. honestly is the core of, you know, patterns like narcissism and psychopathy are people who are ritually and serially abusive. And so I mm -hmm. think that cultures of accountability – become complicated in the face of those mm -hmm. personality styles. They are precisely the people that's baked into their personality where accountability is not very likely, in fact, pretty, mm. very, quite unlikely. However, adding f fuel to that fire is when there's absolutely no consequence and absolutely mm -hmm. account no accountability for protracted periods of time, years and decades. The longer and longer and longer that there's no consequence, it emboldens a person who already is lacking mm -hmm. conscience to keep pushing that envelope. And so you are witnessing sort of a stair-step escalation because mm -hmm. the person really does feel is that they're completely Teflon, that nothing will ever stick. And I, th that's the danger, whereas in a person with a healthier sort of sense of self and healthier mm -hmm. internal organization, that accountability and responsibility is baked into the healthy psyche. That there is right. a, there is, we, you're right, we do all make mistakes. Healthy people tend to try to make amends. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, that like you call the ritual and serial abuse, unfortunately, in certain industries, there's a critical mass of individuals mm -hmm. who engage in that behavior, making that industry riskier. And they tend to be high-risk, high-reward industries, such as entertainment. Yes. Mm -hmm. That so makes that, a lot mm -hmm. of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've now talked to many survivors, Sarah Ann, 
What is a common thing that if there, are there any patterns you've witnessed after people have spoken out in their own stories? Yeah, I look, one thing I will say that I've learned is every single survivor is very different. How we process our trauma can be very different. Where we are in those healing journeys, it's very different. But I do think the common thread is that, you know, none of us walk away unscathed. Mm -hmm. All of us have sort of these longer term impacts from this abuse. And I don't know that I've met anyone who doesn't feel that their career has been harmed from what had happened to them, whether it was that they, like I did early on, sort of held themselves back, whether they faced explicit retaliation, whether they felt like they couldn't talk about what happened to them and it sort of, you know, shut them down emotionally, whether they were facing health issues that made them unable to work. There's always some sort of long-term harm, always economic harm, and then that's on top of the physical and psychological mm -hmm. and interpersonal mm -hmm. harm. So mm -hmm. what I have witnessed is that everybody has these echoes of this one incident yeah. or several incidents, as you mentioned earlier, and some people are better at masking it and some people mm -hmm. maybe seem to pull themselves up from it faster and move on, but it's very common for people to be dealing with the impacts of this years and decades yep. later. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some people, you know, it takes a long time to even fully process it, to fully understand it, to be able to talk about it. And that is that is the one thing I think we all have in common yeah. is learning how to understand what happened to us, learning the actual multi-system impact of it, and then how to not lose ourselves to it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. the responsibility falls on our shoulders yeah. to fix this problem that was never ours to begin with, no. to ask for what we deserve, just a fair and equal chance to live out our lives. We shouldn't be the ones who are being held accountable yeah. for the abuse that was right. you know, done to us. And I think that needs to shift the, <laughs> it's what, it, survivors of sexual violence are, are some of the only survivors of a violent crime who get treated as though they are the perpetrator Correct. of that crime when they're asked about it. And I think it's just, again, it comes down to a cultural shift about how we understand these things, how we talk about them. And I just really believe in trying to use art as an empathy machine and as an educator on all of this. Mm -hmm. And I am I also, I write as well. And it's really important to me that I do that because at least I know what I'm writing will be filtered through the worldview that understands these things. Mm -hmm. I think that's, it's great. You said something that I, I kind of, again, my, my therapist here grabbed onto, which was, <laughs> you know, this idea that you even, you're using it talking about yourself of holding yourself back and people holding themselves mm -hmm. back. I'm actually going to hold your feet to the fire on that one. Because it makes it sound so vo volitional and voluntary. Mm. Don't know that it's holding yourself back. I think what we miss is that trauma is a hijacking of a system. And it's not yes. holding oneself back. It's literally feeling as though safety and permission have been taken away. And mm -hmm. so that I'm always very mindful that trauma survivors don't feel complicit in their mm. own sort of getting stuck, as it were, as many yes. do, because there was a hijacking. And mm -hmm. um, and to take that back is part of the work of healing trauma, to feel comfortable and safe in your own body again. And I, I, it comes back to what you're saying, is that so many survivors, and, and especially sexual violence, are made to feel as somehow they are they are the perpetrators, or they're somehow uh, culpable or responsible, mm -hmm. and that kind of languaging can lead a person then to say, "Well, then I'll, after this happened, then I I stopped myself, I held myself back." Mm -hmm. I'm like, "You did no such thing, you know. This was something that was this something happened to you, and then a systems kicked in to keep you safe, and that subsequently yes. becomes a barrier. So it's it's just shedding that kind of light that you've actually done quite remarkable things in in the face of all of this." Thank you for saying that. And thank you for checking my language on that, because I'm always trying to sort of unpack the words I use mm -hmm. and the impact they have. And I hadn't even thought about that. But you're right, because I feel I feel like it's lost time. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that's the easiest way to describe it. And when I'm angry, it's very easy for me to express it as mm -hmm. he took that from me. Yeah. But when I'm trying to talk about it in a way that feels palatable to other people, I often try to talk about it in the terms of, oh, well, it, it caused me to hold myself back mm -hmm. or it caused me to feel fearful. But you're right. It wasn't. It was just me trying 
to stay safe and trying to reclaim some sort of control over something that was taken from me. And I am resentful of that. I am resentful for all the mm -hmm. time that we lose. And I am resentful for all the opportunities that are taken from us. And I guess I feel lucky that I want to turn that into something yeah. productive rather mm -hmm. than destructive. But it's still, you know, there's still the frustration and the anger there for all of that. And um, hopefully it helps to fuel me to do work mm -hmm. that I would look, I want my career to thrive, obviously, but I'm driven to do this work because it's not just me. Yeah. I think yeah. if I thought it was just me, I probably wouldn't really be doing this. I maybe would move on to something else, but I know it's happening across the yeah. board. I know so many people are impacted in this way. And I just mm -hmm. like, I can't sit there and let it happen when I know there mm -hmm. are things that I can do to try to help. I think it's it's fantastic. I can tell you as a clinician practicing in Los Angeles, the number of stories I've heard of this on the client mm -hmm. side. It's 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 one is too many, but I'm mm -hmm. hearing too many, too many. Sarah, can you tell us about Higher Survivors Hollywood? It's it's really quite remarkable, and I'd love for our listeners to hear about it. Thanks. Yeah, it came to me very organically as I started speaking about the retaliation that I was facing and finding out that this was happening to so many other people in our industry, I started trying to figure out solutions because mm -hmm. I'm sort of a very solution-oriented person. And I started kind of tweeting about how we should be firing abusers and hiring survivors instead and how we should be talking about the talents and the skills of these people, not just the abuse that they've gone through. And then I went to pre-existing organizations and I said, hey, I have some ideas. I think you could help me with this. And I spent about a year pitching these ideas and developing these ideas. And ultimately, I was told, these are great ideas, but we don't have the money or the manpower to do it. You should do it yourself. <laughs> and I thought, well, I certainly don't have the money or the manpower, but I guess I'll do it. And I knew I was going to be speaking uh, on a panel at a film festival with other survivors in New York. And I sort of called up my part-time assistant and I said, hey, I'm going to buy these websites and will you secure the social media handles because I'm going to launch this today finally. And he was very excited. And he's now become my um, director of digital communication, Shane Kalminski. He's been running it with me from the beginning. And we announced that we were going to be an initiative that worked to end retaliation against survivors in the entertainment industry. And we very quickly became a place where we could educate about things that were still happening within the entertainment industry that were abusive, to draw positive attention to survivors. So we do a survivor shout out Sunday every week where we you know, talk about people and their work and to create opportunities for employment for survivors. And we've developed this toolkit, which is on our website. It's also part of the Reframe resource. We have um, consulted on many film projects and gotten lots of survivors work both on camera and behind the camera. And we are working to expand. We're very close to getting fiscal sponsorship. So we should be able to start taking money in finally and getting donations and sort of, you know, feeding our programs that way. But we have, you know, we've given media training to survivors. We've talked to organizations within the entertainment industry, like the Casting Society of America, and tried to encourage people, like casting directors are so important and hold so much power, and it can be really positive power. So we're just really trying to reshape things from the ground up, and not every project has the same needs. So there could be a small film that has filled all of their crew, but has a few roles left to cast and they'd like to make sure they open the door to survivors mm -hmm. and we can help with that. Or we can help when somebody's just starting to write a script and maybe it has to do with survivors, but they're not really well versed in that. We can find them a consultant. We can find them mm -hmm. a co-writer. There's all sorts of things that we can provide, but the focus is on equity and safety and inclusion. And our particular focus is sexual violence survivors, mm -hmm. but we believe the work bleeds out into everything in our industry and will make it easier for all historically marginalized people to be safe and to be included. And I think it all stems from the same thing, which is this concentration and abuse of power. And if we can do our part to address that, I think we can help make things just more pleasant <laughs> for everybody mm -hmm. who's trying to do this work. It, it's it's fantastic. It's such an important anti-oppressive approach within mm. the entertainment industry because this is often an unseen group, right? It, there's not it's not mm -hmm. group membership in the way we would traditionally consider other marginalized group ethnic minority group members. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. it's something that is very and and the people it will cross cut will be across people of 
all ethnicities, all of, you know, the L- certainly in the LGBTQ community, mm-hmm. you'll hear this. We, I, we had spoken to someone on our podcast who talked about this kind of behavior within the modeling industry. I mean, mm-hmm. it's really that you see this as, as something where this is a group that has not often been considered in conversations on equity. And yet there is, it changes a person. To be mm-hmm. a a sexual abuse survivor changes something, and it, it changes how a person shows up professionally. And, and so there's a profundity to really addressing this sort of oppressive this this oppressive corner of the industry in a mm-hmm. way that helps people who really feel unsafe to feel yeah. safe and to actually try or even try again, for, as you said, for people who might have said, I can't do this anymore. This doesn't mm-hmm. feel safe. So I think it's really it's really amazing. And what, what's so inspiring about your story is years of no auditions and, and years mm-hmm. of being pulled out of the industry that you literally entered when, I mean, adolescence to me is still a kid, mm-hmm. when you're still mm-hmm. a kid. Yeah. You're now, you're, you're starting to work again. And, I, and it was so, I, I've watched... Um, she said, and I kind of had my star sighting moment. I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to talk to her. So I felt very <laughs> special in my living room when I saw you because it, it was I, I, I really, really loved the film. For you personally, Sarah Ann, what has been what has the experience been like for you of starting to to work in the industry again and especially with the success of She Said? Thank you. First of all, mm-hmm. I think She Said is such a beautiful yeah. film and I'm very picky about films that depict mm-hmm. survivors of sexual violence, and I felt really confident in this one, and it's such a great team. Uh, it's meant the world to me to be able to be a part of She Said. I felt like to be able to finally have my first feature debut mm-hmm. in something that's so personally meaningful to me, and to get to play this incredible woman, Emily Steele, who's this Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who helped break the story open about Bill O'Reilly, it felt like a full circle moment. It felt like I was reclaiming some of my power and getting some poetic justice. And I never stopped creating. I make my own work. I was never going to completely give up on this. Mm. But to get the validation of having these extremely skilled professionals, you know, Maria Schrader's an incredible director. Dee Dee Gardner is one of the most well-respected producers in the industry. Francine Maisler is one of the best casting directors yeah. that's ever existed. And they don't just give parts to people because it's a nice thing to do. You know, this is a big budget film, high stakes, and I earned my way into it. But I got the opportunity because they were cognizant of Mm -hmm. the inequities that are happening. And it felt wonderful. And it's been really fun to be a part of it. It's like I'm the happiest I ever am when I'm getting to act on set. I feel at home. I feel at peace. I feel like I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. But, you know, I'm still not really getting auditions and mm. I don't know when my next job is coming. And it is, it is that constant struggle for all of us, but it, it definitely is in the back of my head that, okay, this wonderful thing has happened. This great film has happened. I know people know that I can do this. Now I have to make sure that the next job does come in, not just for me, but for all the people in my community that I'm trying to help. And that's why I like I will keep working at this thing of higher survivors for as long as it needs to be there because we can't we can't sort of like take our eye off the ball or else it's just going to be easy to ignore folks like mm-hmm. us again. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. mentioned, you know, survivors are a very diverse group of people. Yes. There's a lot of multiply yes. marginalized people yeah. who are survivors. I myself I'm disabled, I'm queer. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also white and it's mm-hmm. very important to me that our organization does not fall into the traps of white feminism Mm -hmm. and that we have a really diverse group of people sharing their thoughts so that they catch me out if I'm missing something. And I think that's essential. And I'm really pushing hard for our industry to uh, uh, several other people. I know uh, Pamela Guest is another great um, advocate and survivor and actor who is pushing for a recognition of survivors as a protected class. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. several states do recognize survivors of sexual violence, stalking, and domestic violence as a protected class. The EEOC does. So we need to catch up with that. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Historically, uh, there's been a really poor understanding of disabled people as being part of the conversation for DEI as well. So I'm really passionate about making sure people are aware of, I mean, Disabled people, it's a a quarter of the population is disabled. A lot of them are invisibly disabled like I am. And it's similar with sexual violence survivors. One in four women, I believe, one in six men. And we know that those numbers are likely much higher than reported. It's a huge proportion of our 
of our society that has experienced this. And we have to be aware of the challenges that face this community. Absolutely. And and I think that, you know, and I'm, I'm, gra- I'm glad you're bringing up the issue of people who are differently abled, because within that are people who are also living with mental health issues. And mm-hmm. that is an entirely a group that, that it's people are speaking out about it, but they're not. I actually think we're in an interesting inversion moment where a lot of people are speaking about it openly, but a lot more people aren't. And mm-hmm. that, that the people think doors are open, but there's actually sort of like it's it's very tricky glass that you actually can't walk mm-hmm. through. So I'm 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 so glad you're bringing up all of those dimensions of what what defines these these traditional again traditionally underrepresented groups mm-hmm. and so, and and you know elevating equity. You know, one, another question that hit me is as you made she said as a survivor of that experience of that moment of mm-hmm. of, of this particular of, of Harvey Weinstein's abuse what was it like for you psychologically to be an artist within a project mm-hmm. that was actually also capturing the story of your your real life pain it was for me extremely empowering mm-hmm. um like I said, I got to read the script once I accepted mm. the role. I got to read the whole script. So I knew that, yes, this is the story of these journalists, but it also very much gives focus to several of the women who decided to go on the record and the challenges of that, the, the real fears that go along with making yourself so vulnerable and sharing this part of your story. And so I knew I was getting to participate in a film that I felt ethically aligned with and that I felt was a really good way to tell this story mm-hmm. again in a way that would hit people in a different in a different facet, you know, hit them in their hearts and hit them so it really humanized the experience. And it didn't ever, you know, sensationalize the sexual violence. It didn't show it on screen, which I really appreciated. And I got to play I got to play a character who reveals to uh, one of the journalists who's investigating Harvey that one of their sources, Lisa Bloom, who was the lawyer, is actually working with Harvey and is actually working against survivors. And Lisa Bloom is someone who I have always had a huge amount of antipathy for and resentment towards. And to get to play a character who was sort of calling her out felt very empowering to me and and fun to get to do that. It's like, we're not just talking about Harvey. We are talking about the systems around him and the people who were complicit. And I think that's a really important part of it. It, it is a huge part of it. And I think that that systemic complicity is is a part of even this conversation we talk about in terms of unacceptable behavior within mm-hmm. not only individual relationships, but systemic relationships. The focus of this this podcast is that, recogni- that recognition of complicity. And it also, also becomes a personal responsibility for anyone to mm-hmm. ask themselves, as I walk into a system, as I recognize what's happening, how can I be sure to check in with myself? I mean, this is, these are all really complicated conversations, but I, mm-hmm. I do think that this entire, the, the entire movement that came of this, of recognition of these issues, it, it was absolutely an issue of gender, but it was also an issue of oppression. And of course, mm-hmm. from my seat, I also thought it was an issue of narcissism. So I think mm-hmm. that all of those things were playing a role. So Sarah, it, it, how did you feel after Weinstein was convicted and sentenced? Hmm. Um, it's very complicated. I think I felt relief because it was a form of justice. And I, I had a, a civil legal battle with Weinstein that lasted about four and a half years. And I was one of the only remaining um, people in this civil suit because I fell under federal sex trafficking laws. So the statute of limitation hadn't passed. And I just... The judge was really difficult and very regressive, and it cost survivors a lot in that fight. And we ultimately ended up, uh, me and the two other women who were left in this case, ended up fighting to create a victim's fund out of the bankruptcy. And that was a very complicated legal situation. So I know from my own personal experience on the civil side how scary this all is. You know, unless you've been through it, things like discovery, getting your computer and your phone taken, preparing for depositions, knowing that you're going to have to be in the same room with your abuser again, like it is terrifying. And so for all the women who agreed to participate in these criminal cases, I owe them so much respect and so much gratitude, but also knowing that not everybody who wanted to be able to bring forward a criminal 
case was able to. I think it's important that working within the system that we have, seeing that occasionally it does work to serve justice is really important. And it's not perfect justice and it's certainly not comprehensive, but I believe he's in a place now where he can't physically hurt people anymore. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also think it's important to watch people who are so powerful have to be held accountable. And it doesn't always happen. We saw what happened with Bill Cosby. Danny Masterson, luckily, is going to be retried, but and Kevin Spacey got off the hook in New York. I have hopes for the UK, but there are powerful abusers who get a pass, and then occasionally there are powerful abusers who are held accountable, and I hope it's been healing for survivors to see that, whether they're survivors of Weinstein himself or whether they're survivors of other abusers. I hope at least seeing somebody occasionally found guilty and having to serve time brings them some sense of peace and a sense that there can be there can be progress made on all of this it, it, uh, thank you thank you for sharing that you you're you're bringing up such a complicated issue for survivors which is this issue of justice right mm-hmm. it is it seems many times in these cases to be more the exception and the rule we know that prosecution of sexual assault cases, actually, they, they, it's often the, the least likely that those cases mm-hmm. will be uh, tried and adjudicated and prosecuted and, and sentenced in a manner that actually does leave survivors feeling whole. Listen, we can even look at the Jeffrey Epstein case. Even when mm-hmm. the, uh, when in after in Miami, they they actually let him go so he could then yeah. go reperpetrate for years. I mean, so even when it does go through the system, it's actually it's 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 often a miscarriage of justice. Mm-hmm. And what the one of the most complicated issues for survivors of any form of abuse, I think it's really magnified in survivors of of sexual assault, is that lack of justice. Even the way the system is set up, as you said, these these procedures are almost designed to re-traumatize. Yeah, I I have a huge amount of understanding and empathy for that. It's why, you know, I... Like I keep going back to this is the system we have to work within. Mm-hmm. So I I guess there's a generally positive feeling when I feel like the system is working, <laughs> whatever that means, because um, I do think the system is set up to work in a way that is often against the survivors. But, you know, it doesn't fix everything. It doesn't take away my pain. It mm-hmm. doesn't take away the repercussions of what have happened. But I do feel safer knowing he can't cause physical harm. So Mm -hmm. it is, as you say, it's very complicated, Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. when it is your abuser, even when there is this supposed justice being served, it doesn't feel like a complete, there's the period on the sentence, Mm -hmm. now we can move on. No, and I think that that's often the mistake too, is that survivors would be told, let's say the case was adjudicated in a manner that the person was found guilty, they Mm -hmm. are facing a sentence, and then there, there's a, the arrogance of turning to the survivor and saying, no, there, now you must be fine. And I'm saying, mm-hmm. oh, no, no, no. Uh, we see <laughs> such a range of reaction from some survivors saying, I should feel fine and I don't. What's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. So there can be self-blame. In some cases, there may even be guilt. I mean, it, it's, it's a very, very complicated series of reactions. And so this idea of it being a punctuation mark, at best, it's a semicolon that where like <laughs> yeah. there's a whole hell of a lot of thought still happening after mm-hmm. that moment and of healing. And I think that the healing goes off in different directions depending on how where the case winds up. But many times, Times, many times the only reason these cases ended up in situations where there was where, where there was a, a guilty verdict delivered was that these survivors literally had to put their souls and psyches on mm. the line in a courtroom to face their mm-hmm. worst fears, to live in a nightmarish state for months and years at a time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've read what's happened to some of the women who have taken the stand in both New York and California in this case and many other cases, and it is shocking. I think lawyers who engage in those victim-blaming tactics should be disbarred. Um, There's no basis in fact or legality in what they're doing, and it is deeply re-traumatizing. And I'm just, that's why I said, like, the bravery and what we owe the people who do agree to put themselves through that is immense because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it is not easy and it is not set up to be at all trauma-informed. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-mm. Oh no! It, whatever the opposite of trauma informed <laughs> is how our justice system yeah. works. To be honest yeah. with you, really. <laughs> so, yeah. for you personally, Sarah Ann, what are you hoping for for your future in the entertainment industry? I just want to work. You know, mm-hmm. I just want to mm-hmm. be hired mm-hmm. to act in other people's projects. That I want to make my projects that I'm writing, and I want to bring along talented people with me as I succeed. And I want to model what I'm trying to get the rest of the industry to do in my hiring practices and in my, you know, culture of my sets. And I, I won't ever stop doing it. Nobody's Mm -hmm. ever going to get me to stop. (laughs) Even if Mm -hmm. everybody says no and stops calling, I can make my own work, but I do, I have some exciting projects on the, you know, coming up in the future. And I hope that they are really successful. Um, one that I'd like to mention is actually a musical called The Right Girl. Mm -hmm. And the writer of the script is a a fellow Weinstein survivor named Mm -hmm. Louisette Geis. And the music is all by Diane Warren. And they have brought in a bunch of survivors as story contributors who get to financially benefit once the show opens and recoups. And I'm lucky enough to also be an actor in that project. And it goes back to my first love of musical theater. And so that's really great. And it's just a project that I, I hope people get really excited by. And you know, there's good stuff being made and there are good people still working in this yep. industry. And it's just about saying yes to the right thing instead of saying yes to the familiar thing sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm so I'm so glad you said that. First of all, congratulations. You have to tell us where we Thank can you. find the right girl because I would love to yeah. see it. Um, Hopefully Broadway soon. <laughs> oh, yay. Well, there you go. There's all the reason to go yeah. to New York and, and see. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. So I think, exactly. I, I think it's, you know, I think we are... And I had read an interesting article recently in the L.A. Times and and seeing more of this. I'm beginning to see the willingness to start telling more nuanced tales of women Mm -hmm. and um, that aren't just informed by hegemonic representations of women, but are actually Mm -hmm. represented by, again, very subtle, layered representations of women because of invalidating, manipulative, and downright abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. We've lost so much voice in our world, people who Mm -hmm. believe that their voices didn't, weren't worthy of being heard. And if nothing else, to me, making awareness of these things means we're going to hit hear a much larger and more diverse chorus of voices and with often really lyrically beautiful stories because despite these wounds they carry it's through that suffering that we actually often get far far more beautiful art in all of its forms so that's my hope what comes out of it where can people find you and connect with you and your organization I'm really easy to find on social media. It's just my full name, okay. Sarah Ann Massey. Um, Sarah with an H and with no E. Uh, and then Higher Survivors Hollywood is Higher Survivors on Twitter, Higher Survivors Hollywood on Instagram, and our website is HigherSurvivorsHollywood.org. Okay. All right, great. Yeah. And we'll have that in our, our show notes as well so people can great. find you. So thank you so much. And now as my final thought, I'd like to ask you, what is a piece of advice you would give to a survivor of an abusive relationship? My advice is always try to remember that nothing that happened to you is your fault and find a way to share your story that feels safe and never feel pressured to do it in a way that doesn't. So I think especially after Me Too became very mainstream after Tarana Burke's decade of tireless work, there was a sense that it was a requirement for survivors to tell their stories in this public way. And I think it's really important that we don't push that because one of the things we lose is our autonomy and our voice as survivors. And if we are going to choose to share this extremely vulnerable, impactful thing that happened to us, we have to do it in a way that feels right and safe. So sometimes it's telling a therapist, sometimes it's telling a trusted friend or family member, sometimes it's writing it in your journal, and sometimes it's shouting it to the world through the media or social media. But whatever it is, make sure it feels like what you're ready to do and what feels right for you. And again, thank you, Sarah Ann. I am just, I'm, I'm absolutely awestruck by what you're doing in Higher Survivors oh. Hollywood. I think it's just amazing. I, I wish this actually existed in some way, shape, or form in almost every industry. And yours might be the model 
program. That certainly there be tweaks for other industries, but it's needed. So, and this That's was not the an, hope actually. Yeah, yeah this yeah. was this was yeah. not an easy industry to do it in, and yet you did it. And so I, I again, as I've always held for survivorship, that the things that come out of our pain are often the most beautiful things of all. Thank you again, Sarah Ann, for your beautiful story of survival. Our our audience needs to hear this. And I'm very, very grateful to you for your for your time Thank you. today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you so much for having me here. Yeah, of it was course. such a pleasure. Thank you. In my first takeaway, once again, Sarah Ann's story, like so many others, reminds us of the importance of having one validating person to talk to after the experience of trauma. Sarah Ann shared that she talked with her mother immediately after her assault and how that did ground her. Many, if not most, trauma survivors either do not have that person or may feel so frozen in fear or shame that they do not know who to tell. Especially in cases of sexual assault, many trauma survivors blame themselves. If you have experienced sexual assault and want to confidentially talk with someone, please go to rain.org. INN.org or call the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 800 656 HOPE, H O P E, which is 800 656 4673. For our next takeaway, there is a danger in viewing trauma or assault as a single episode in a person's life. It simplifies the process to the world and misses the far-reaching impact on the survivor's life. Trauma disrupts a life. It can interrupt social and emotional development as well as professional development. Trauma survivors feel they lose time as they process what happens to them. And in many cases, as we saw for Sarah Ann, they lose opportunities. Not only does time freeze and distort during the traumatic experience itself, the same time distortion happens for the survivors. There is a risk that the world at large looks at trauma survivors and wonders how one day or one experience can be so disruptive. It can because it changes how a survivor perceives the world. And Sarah Ann's story captures that of millions of trauma survivors and is a call out for all of us to keep talking about sexual trauma as well as for more empathy, understanding, and awareness from schools, industries, justice systems, and the world at large. In this next takeaway, can perpetrating behavior change without consequences? I don't think so, no. Will it change even if there are consequences? It depends. The conversation often drifts to, how can we stop the perpetrators? It's all but impossible to do that after they've been emboldened, and we have seen that story of people looking the other way and the absence of consequences in so many of these public stories for so many years. Sarah Ann's and the experience of so many people in not only the entertainment industry, but in a variety of industries, ranging from domestic workers to actors to any job out there, is that survivors are often not heard and are often re-traumatized by processes like interrogation, silencing, shaming, smear campaigns, and the trauma of procedures that require people to face their perpetrator in court. It is no wonder that many people do not feel safe pursuing charges and complaints, which results in emboldening perpetrators further. The systems must change and must be informed by trauma-based science and practice. In our next takeaway, there are many things that can make certain industries more likely to foster abuse. Sarah Ann was speaking about a specific industry, the entertainment industry, which has historically had a poor track record of emboldening abusers. It's an industry where there's a high bar for entry, in which many people who often have far less social power or status, and they're young, they don't have resources that they're attempting to get into, 
There are also issues in how people are paid for work, with most people working shorter-term stints and having to find new work all the time, which can result in less protection or even spotting of patterns since jobs and people are constantly in flux, which makes them more vulnerable. She also highlights other industries, namely people who do domestic work, who are also often less empowered, hold less status, and do not have health and safety protections, and also vulnerable to workplace harm. And again, this is mirrored in service professions like restaurant servers, hotel employees. But these public cases of large-scale abuse should not just serve as salacious entertainment. We must learn from this and create the reforms and accountability that are needed to protect people from trauma and abuses that can affect them for lifetimes. Now, lastly, healing is a thousand small things that survivors do that can sometimes culminate in a big thing. Sarah Ann's focus on creating safer spaces for sexual assault survivors in Hollywood culminated in Higher Survivors Hollywood. But she shared that sometimes it was small and hopeful acts, like calling the switchboard at a major studio, that culminated in not only a meeting, but an audition. So many things may institutionally be taken away from people who are harmed and betrayed by large organizations. And it can feel hopeless for people in these systems to do anything. But it is the small things and the willingness of survivors to give themselves permission to do these things that can change the world. This can include reflecting on what it is survivors need, what could help others in this kind of a situation, how to create greater safety in their communities or workplaces, and doing the small things that can get there. Trauma can rob people of a sense of agency or the idea that anything you do actually matters. And my hope is that Sarah Ann's story, despite the terrible economic and professional impact her experiences have had on her, including losing work and auditions, is a reminder that healing means persisting in even the smallest ways. Thank you everyone for tuning in and make sure to rate and share this show and subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram at Dr. Romani. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Navigating Narcissism. <laughs>